In an extraordinary and mysterious event that has captivated people worldwide, a photograph surfaced recently depicting a glowing white cross hovering above the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem during daylight. This extraordinary image has sparked intense debate, with many wondering if it is a divine sign, a spiritual message, or perhaps even a warning. The photograph, taken by a local resident who was visiting the area, shows a bright, cross-shaped object floating in the sky above one of the most sacred and contentious sites in the world, the Dome of the Rock. The iconic Golden Dome, part of the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound and a central figure in both Islamic and Jewish traditions, has seen its share of unexplained events, but the sighting of a cross adds an entirely new dimension to the layers of religious symbolism already tied to this historic place. The photograph, which has now gone viral on social media and news outlets, shows a clear glowing cross suspended in the sky, starkly visible in the daytime. Unlike typical lens flares or reflections, the cross appears unusually defined, with sharp edges and a radiant white glow that contrasts with the blue sky and the surrounding buildings. Witnesses described the sighting as peaceful yet otherworldly, with the object reportedly hovering silently for several minutes before gradually fading from view. The person who captured the image, identified only as a local who wishes to remain anonymous, said they were visiting the old city when they noticed the unusual light. For many Christians, the sight of a glowing cross above such a significant religious site is seen as a powerful sign of hope and faith. Some have interpreted the event as a message of peace or a divine signal urging unity among the Abrahamic faiths, all of which consider Jerusalem to be a sacred city. In a world that seems increasingly divided along religious and political lines, the cross may symbolize the need for harmony and reconciliation between the different faith communities that share the city. However, not everyone interprets the sighting in a positive light. Others see the cross as a potential warning, particularly given the ongoing tensions in the region. Jerusalem has long been a flashpoint for conflict, and the appearance of such a symbol above one of the most contested sites in the city could be viewed as a harbinger of future strife. Some fear that the sighting may stir up further religious fervor or deepen existing divisions between the city's communities. To these individuals, the cross could be a sign of impending judgment or a reminder of the spiritual and moral challenges facing humanity. In addition to the religious interpretations, some have speculated about whether the cross could be connected to broader global events such as climate change, natural disasters, or even geopolitical instability. There is a growing sense that humanity is at a crossroads, facing unprecedented challenges, and for some, the cross in the sky over Jerusalem is a reminder of the fragile nature of peace and the need for greater spiritual reflection in the face of global uncertainty. As with many extraordinary sightings, there are skeptics who believe that the glowing cross is not a divine sign, but rather an optical illusion or man-made phenomenon. Some have suggested that the cross could be a result of light reflections, atmospheric conditions, or even a drone-related display. For those who believe this could be a genuine divine apparition, the symbolism of the cross is significant. As the central symbol of Christianity, the cross represents salvation, sacrifice, and the hope for eternal life through Jesus Christ. Its sudden appearance over such a holy site could be seen as a divine reminder of God's presence and power, particularly in a world facing increasing crises. One of the most compelling aspects of the sighting is its location. The Dome of the Rock is one of the most sacred places for Jews, Christians and Muslims alike. It is a site rich with history and religious meaning, and its significance extends across the Abrahamic faiths. Some interpret the appearance of a cross over this holy site as a divine call for unity among these faiths a message urging peace and reconciliation in a region often torn by religious and political conflict. Within this context, the glowing cross could be seen as a message from God, reminding humanity of our shared heritage and common spiritual roots. The Abrahamic religions all trace their origins back to the same patriarch, Abraham, and share many fundamental beliefs about the nature of God, morality, and the purpose of life. In a world often divided by religious differences, the cross over the Dome of the Rock might serve as a reminder of the importance of peace, tolerance, and mutual respect. Many Christians and believers who have seen the image have echoed this sentiment, calling for unity and renewed dialogue among Jews, Muslims, and Christians. They argue that this sighting is not a coincidence, 
but rather a divinely orchestrated event meant to remind the world that God is still present and that unity can be achieved through faith, forgiveness, and love. On the other hand, some believers view the sighting as a potential warning, an omen that could signal the beginning of a period of divine judgment or apocalyptic events. According to some interpretations of Christian eschatology, the study of the end times, signs and wonders in the heavens are often linked to prophecies about the end of the world. In the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments contain numerous references to unusual signs in the sky as precursors to the Day of Judgment. For some Christians who subscribe to these interpretations, the glowing cross over the Dome of the Rock could be seen as one such sign. They view it as a divine warning, a call for humanity to repent and prepare for the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. According to this perspective, the sighting may signal that the world is entering a period of tribulation and that the faithful should be vigilant and ready for the return of Christ. This apocalyptic interpretation is not limited to Christianity. In Islam too, there are prophecies about signs in the sky that will precede the Day of Judgment, including unusual celestial phenomena and heavenly manifestations. Some Muslims who have seen the photograph of the glowing cross have expressed concern that this event might be connected to these eschatological predictions, warning that humanity must heed the signs of God before it's too late. The appearance of a glowing white cross above the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem during the daytime remains a profound mystery. For many, the image is a powerful reminder of the city's central place in the spiritual history of the world's three major monotheistic religions. Whether seen as a sign of hope, a divine warning, or simply a curious optical phenomenon, the photograph has sparked deep reflection and debate among religious scholars, believers, and skeptics alike. Pope John Paul II personally performed three exorcisms during his reign. While the Vatican typically refuses to call an event an actual exorcism, they do, however, acknowledge the events which they are describing. The Pope might seem symbolic as we usually only see ceremonious duties, but the Catholic head does perform papal exorcisms and other duties. Italian journalist Fabio Marquis Ragona has always maintained that he believes that demons are real and prowl about the earth looking for souls. He is a primary source for the history of Vatican exorcisms, John Paul II being no exception. Ragona stated that he has spoken to several exorcists who said the devil was terrified of John Paul II. He is said to have performed at least three exorcisms in his day, in 1982, 1984 and 2000. Before John Paul II, exorcism was considered a medieval practice, going away with the development of medicine and technology, but in 1998 the Pope actually approved an updated form of the rite of exorcism, nearly 400 years after the first rite was established and released. He himself had already performed two exorcisms at this point and believed it was necessary to have this practice reinstated and, when necessary, used. On March 27, 1982, Francesca was with her family when they arrived in St. Peter's Square. Doctors were unable to solve the enigma, as the woman was under the care of a priest who was an exorcist, and of her parish priest at the time. Because her case was so unexplainable and unsolvable, Bishop Alberti of Spoleto brought the young woman before the Pope. This woman was completely emotionless. The Pope brought forth the rite of exorcism and began to read it in Latin. As the scripture was read aloud, she began to tremble and ultimately rolled around on the floor, shouting and shrieking. He was praying and eventually the possession was pulled from her body and left her alone, finally. The woman, Francesca, is leading a normal life, married with four children. Gabriele Amorth was the exorcist for the Diocese of Rome. Francesca visited him afterwards and with his own eyes saw that the woman was completely fine and normal. Demonic possession is a phenomenon deeply ingrained in the annals of human history, transcending cultures, religions, and time periods. The belief in supernatural entities inhabiting human bodies, often leading to erratic behavior and affliction, has shaped societies and religious doctrines for millennia. The concept of demonic possession can be traced back to ancient civilizations, 
where it played a central role in understanding the inexplicable. In Mesopotamia, the Epic of Gilgamesh mentions spirits and malevolent forces that could possess humans. In ancient Egypt, various spells and rituals were developed to exorcise evil spirits believed to cause illnesses. In the Hebrew Bible, particularly the Old Testament, accounts of demonic possession are found. The Hebrew word Shadim refers to evil spirits or demons that were believed to influence human behavior. Notable instances include King Saul's possession in the book of Samuel and the story of the demon-possessed man in the New Testament's Gospel of Mark. Demonic possession also held significance in classical antiquity. Ancient Greeks believed in daemons, supernatural beings that could possess individuals, leading to madness or erratic behavior. Greek mythology featured tales of people being possessed by various gods and spirits, such as Dionysus, the god of wine and ecstasy. In Roman society, belief in spirits and possession persisted, with exorcisms and rituals aimed at banishing malevolent entities. The Roman historian Livy documented instances of demonic possession in his works, emphasizing the role of supernatural forces in human affairs. Demonic possession took on a new dimension with the rise of Christianity in the medieval period. The Church played a pivotal role in shaping beliefs about possession, with the emergence of exorcism as a formalized ritual. The Gospels' accounts of Jesus' exorcisms contributed to the Church's recognition of the phenomenon. The infamous Salem witch trials in the late 17th century are a dark chapter in the history of demonic possession. In Puritan America, fear of witches and possession led to the persecution and execution of numerous individuals accused of being possessed or practicing witchcraft. During the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods, there was a shift towards more rational and scientific explanations for behaviors previously attributed to demonic possession. The emergence of psychology and the understanding of illnesses marked a turning point in how society viewed cases of possession. Prominent figures like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung began to interpret alleged possession as manifestations of psychological disorders, often influenced by suppressed traumas or personal conflicts. As a result, exorcisms and witch hunts gradually declined in favor of medical and psychiatric interventions. In contemporary times, the belief in demonic possession persists in certain religious and cultural contexts. While skepticism about possession as a supernatural phenomenon prevails in secular societies, it remains a potent force in many religious communities. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, continues to perform exorcisms under specific circumstances. Cultural expressions of demonic possession have also evolved. Horror films, literature, and popular culture often draw on the concept of possession to terrify and captivate audiences. A group of approximately 250 clergymen hailing from 50 different nations has gathered in the Eternal City of Rome. Their purpose, to deepen their understanding of the intricate and often mysterious phenomenon of demonic possession. This exceptional congregation of priests has come together to engage in an enlightening exploration, one that encompasses not only theoretical knowledge, but also first-hand experiences shared by their fellow brethren. Exorcism continues to be a topic of considerable controversy, primarily fueled by its portrayal in popular culture and horror movies. However, it is important to acknowledge that alongside this media representation, there have also been instances where the practice of exorcism has been associated with cases of misuse. The week-long educational program organized by the Vatican, known as the Exorcism and the Prayer of Liberation, is widely recognized as the sole international series of lectures dedicated to this particular subject matter. Commencing its inaugural session in the year 2005, this program has witnessed a remarkable increase in participant numbers, with the attendance of priests more than doubling since its inception. Catholic priests from various countries have recently shared with the media that there has been a noticeable rise in individuals coming forward and recounting experiences that they believe to be indicative of being possessed by demonic entities. In a significant pronouncement made last year, Pope Francis emphasized the importance of addressing the genuine spiritual disturbances that some parishioners may face. According to reports, the number of individuals seeking exorcisms in Italy reaches an astonishing half a million annually. This phenomenon is not exclusive to Italy alone, as a 2017 report by Christian think tank Theos indicated a growing trend in the United Kingdom as well. 
One contributing factor to this increase is believed to be the proliferation of Pentecostal churches. In response to the increasing demand, several dioceses have taken the initiative to create their own educational programs. This trend can be observed in regions such as Sicily in Italy and the bustling city of Chicago in the United States. According to Father Gary Thomas, an experienced American priest with over a decade of exorcism practice, there has been a notable rise in the demand for exorcisms. One contributing factor to this phenomenon, he suggests, is the growing reliance on social sciences in our society, resulting in fewer churches training priests as exorcists. This decline in exorcism training within the Christian church has subsequently led to an increase in superstitious beliefs and practices. As society increasingly leans towards a more scientific and secular approach, the traditional role of exorcists has diminished. According to Italian priest Benigno Paglia, who shared his insights with Vatican News, the increasing popularity of practices like tarot card readings and sorcery has sparked a resurgence in the need for exorcisms. In the realm of exorcisms, it is important to note that only a small fraction of cases truly necessitate a significant exorcism procedure. In the year 1999, the Catholic Church embarked on a significant endeavor to revise and update the regulations governing exorcism, marking the first comprehensive revision since the year 1614. In the process of dealing with a possessed individual, the priest will employ a sequence of deliverance prayers to alleviate the presence of evil. According to information provided by Catholic officials, during a possession ritual, it is customary for the priest to wear a specific attire consisting of an intricately embroidered white tunic known as a surplice, accompanied by a stole in the color purple. In order to ensure the effectiveness of the ritual, the individual believed to be possessed is often physically restrained. Furthermore, the utilization of holy water is considered an essential element in this process. In a comprehensive and in-depth manner, the priest invokes the intercession of saints, engages in prayer, and shares selected passages from the Bible that depict Jesus' powerful acts of exorcising demons from afflicted individuals. Through the invocation of Jesus' name, the priest beseeches the malevolent spirit that has possessed an individual to submit to the divine authority of God and to depart from the afflicted person's being. This entreaty, replete with unwavering determination, may be repeated as many times as necessary until the exorcism is deemed successful by the discerning priest. Once convinced of the spirit's departure, the priest then engages in prayer, fervently seeking divine intervention to ensure that the tormenting presence of the evil entity will no longer afflict the individual. Christianity has been the origin of countless theological debates. Even today, the many enigmas of the faith continue to haunt the natural curiosity of humanity. For all its faults or virtues, it's impossible to deny Christianity's plentiful and intriguing history. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three Christian discoveries. Crypt believed to be Jesus' tomb opened for the first time in centuries. The story of Jesus' return from death is perhaps one of the most popular biblical stories, but the tomb that may have belonged to him has sat dark, dim and unopened for centuries until now. Researchers investigating Old Jerusalem uncovered a tomb. Inside the tomb sat a limestone bed, just like the one rumoured to have been used for the body of Christ in those three days before he rose again. With the researchers was the Greek Orthodox father, Isidorus Fakitsis, who stated, We saw where Jesus Christ was laid down. Before, nobody has. We have the history, the tradition. Now we saw with our own eyes the actual burial place of Jesus Christ. Researchers spent 60 hours investigating the tomb. Before they left it, they reinforced its supports to preserve it for the future. Yet with little to no intention of returning for the foreseeable years. Before it was resealed, an estimated 50 scientists, researchers and priests visited the site and very well might be the only people to see it with their own eyes for decades, if not centuries to come. A shrine has long since been built around the tomb, a holy site known as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Throughout its existence, many Christians have come to this church to lay their respects. The tomb was first discovered long before our time 
when the first Christian Roman Emperor, Constantine, ruled in the 4th century AD. In the 7th century, the region was ravaged by Persian forces following the fall of Jerusalem, and later again in the 11th century was destroyed during the conflict with the Muslim caliphs. It had a long, extensive history of being destroyed and rebuilt, though the tomb remained sealed all this time, or as far as we know. Various organizations were chosen to deal with the research of the tomb and its investigation, including the National Geographic Society, the National Technical University of Athens, and the National Geographic Channel. The project as a whole circles around the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The researchers had no initial intention of heading into the tomb. The shrine had fallen into disrepair. The mortar, columns, and every aspect of the shrine needed to be disassembled and replaced or restored. The researchers worried that there could be a leak within the tomb that led them to unseal it. When the tomb was opened, it was done in a highly specific, careful manner, as archaeologists predicted lifting the entrance would fracture it. According to the assistant professor of civil engineering, Harris Mazakis, we had to be very careful. It was not just a tomb we had to open. It was the tomb of Jesus Christ that is a symbol for all of Christianity, and not only for them, but for other religions. Mazakis claims that the restoration has gone successfully and will preserve the shrine for another 500 years or so. The Nazareth Inscription the Nazareth inscription is one of the most recognized Christian relics. It's a Greek marble tablet upon which sits the Nazareth decree, written supposedly by an unnamed individual of the Caesar line. The decree asserts that tomb robbing or destruction is punishable by the highest means, and was initially dated to the 1st century AD. The Louvre currently possesses the 24 by 15 inch Nazareth inscription. Despite never mentioning Jesus Christ, it has come to be known as a staple Christian relic. Despite its name pertaining to Nazareth, researchers found that it likely originated in Kos, a Greek island. This has shaken the Christian community and put doubt into whether any connection exists between the tablet and Christianity at all. Historians have since suggested that the inscription may have been about the tomb of Nicias, a Greek tyrant and dated to 20 BCE instead of early AD. Investigations have proven it could have been created any time between 50 BCE and 50 AD. Of its known history, in 1878 the tablet was purchased by Wilhelm Fruner in Nazareth itself. Fruner sent the tablet to Paris. This means that although the tablet was in Nazareth, it likely had not been found there, but rather was sold there as at the time Jerusalem had a booming relic and antiquities marketplace. The text also refers not to the one Christian God, but to plural gods, and further lessening its likelihood to truly have anything to do with the faith. Another reason why it's unlikely that the Nazareth tablet is from Nazareth is the lack of marble in Jerusalem. If it was made there, the marble would have been imported. However, the Greek dialect archaeologists have found is not fluent. Therefore, its origins, to this day, remain a mystery. Evidence Noah's Biblical Flood Happened Christians, historians, and archaeologists have all yearned to uncover whether there is any truth behind the biblical tale of Noah's Ark for millennia. Now, an archaeologist believes he has uncovered the truth behind the mythical happening, claiming its presence in the Bible was based on a real-life flood. Underwater archaeologist Robert Ballard has stated he and his researchers uncovered the evidence of Noah's Ark near the coast of Turkey in the Black Sea. Originally, the team was searching for lost ancient civilizations beneath sea level. Robert Ballard was one of those responsible for the impeccable discovery of the Titanic. According to Ballard, 12,000 years ago that part of the world was covered in ice. When that ice began to melt, the sea levels rose significantly, flooding major parts of the world. Students of the University of Columbia suggested that there was only one flood in the Black Sea region, that thousands of years ago the Black Sea was nothing more than a lone freshwater lake in the midst of hills and meadows, until a terrible flood from the Mediterranean Sea covered those meadows and all that land, 
expanding the sea level and creating the Black Sea as it is now known. Ballard was taken by the theory and set out to investigate. The team found an ancient shoreline, 400 feet below the sea level. Evidence to prove that the Black Sea suffered, at some point in its history, a massive flood. The fossils located near this flooded shoreline revealed it occurred about 7,000 years ago, slotting perfectly with the time frame Christian scholars believe Noah's Ark happened. Ballard's theory is that word of mouth of the terrible flood, which would have been abrupt and unexpected, passed generationally until finally being recorded and added to the Bible. Because many aspects of the biblical tale seem impossible, such as Noah's extraordinary life expectancy of several hundred years, it's considered more probable that the Black Sea Flood inspired the story rather than as a direct account of what happened, though it remains a mystery still. Some scholars pose that Noah's Ark might have been further inspired by the ancient epic of Gilgamesh. Eric Klein, a biblical archaeologist, claims, the earlier Mesopotamian stories are very similar where the gods are sending a flood to wipe out humans. There is one man they choose to survive. He builds a boat and brings on animals and lands on a mountain and lives happily ever after. I would argue that it is the same story. It's uncertain whether Noah's Ark, as the Bible records it, actually happened. But Ballard's discovery proves that there were devastating floods in that same period of time and that people did struggle to keep their communities afloat and alive. Ballard's research found many fragments of antique pottery and a sunken ship. There, the team uncovered a molar and femur bone. The entire wreck was extremely well preserved as a result of the little oxygen in the Black Sea where life struggles to exist. As such, decay rapidly slows in its depths. Unfortunately, the ship was only dated to about 500 BCE nowhere near the 7,000-year mark that would signify the right flood. Ballard, however, is determined to keep investigating the region to uncover more evidence and to get to the bottom of the truth. He asserts the deep sea is the largest museum on Earth. Ballard does not believe that Noah's Ark, as we know it, will ever be discovered. If it ever existed, it likely decayed by now. But what can be found is proof that communities lived down in those depths before the sea levels rose.